<laughs> First Samuel, the sixth chapter is where we are. First Samuel, chapter six. We are marching through Samuel. And as I said last week, um, this is history. And so I realize some people don't like history. It is Bible. And we try to make application out of it as we can, and as we see fit, but not too much. Uh, we could make a lot more, but the reason we don't is because we don't want to, to be too slow about going to this. You know, I, I know of a, I know of guys that have done series on say Psalms, and it takes takes them four or five years. And I know one guy. What was it they told me? It took him three years to go through the book of Matthew, and and there he is. There's a lot there, but sometimes you get so bogged down, you neglect the rest of it, and so we don't want to do that. But uh, we, if you recall, in the fifth chapter, we made the statement that really the fifth chapter goes with the sixth chapter. The fifth chapter was uh, we have the, the Ark of the Covenant uh, captured. We have, or that's really the fourth chapter. In the fifth chapter, we have that it is carried away to where the Philistines are, it is put beside their god, Dagon, and basically it shows it up, so to speak. And so we get to that point, that's where we've been, and so we get now to the sixth chapter. It says, The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months, and the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how, shall, how we should send it to its place. This is, this is I, I just find this fun right here. I find the fifth chapter very fun. I find the sixth chapter very fun. But let's think about just a couple of verses uh, right quick. It says uh, the ark hadn't been there long. It's been there, been there seven months. Now, go back and, and read what we talked about last week with regards to, to, to the and really not shenanigans, just the power of God versus the power of Dagon, which is what I think God was trying to prove. And he proved it by, you know, the, the ark would be sitting beside the, the idol, and of course it fell over and it broke, and, and one night without anything happening. But the fifth things are ready to get rid of the ark. Remember, as we said last week, we said the week before, the ark, uh, the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat is sitting on, or is, excuse me, the mercy seat is on top, and there is always the thought or was always the thought that God was sitting in that mercy seat. There, there in the Ark of the Covenant had the presence of God. And with that, when they, when they were, was brought into the Philistine camp, of course, as we said, the things happened. And the Philistines said, we're, we're tired of this. We're upset. It, it's turning us and what we're thinking and what we believe upside down. We want to get rid of it. It's been here long enough. It's interesting because notice what verse 2 says, and in the Philistines called the priests and the diviners, probably their priests from the standpoint, not, not the children of Israel's priests, but their priests, but their preachers, if you will, and diviners. Now, diviners, you find them as well in the book of Ezekiel, the 21st chapter, 23rd verse. The diviners were individuals that... Um, well, if you go to Ezekiel, it talks about them reading the livers and shaking the, the cords to, to determine, if you will, what was going to happen next. Uh, Willis, in his commentary, makes an interesting point, which I did not check out even further. The Hebrew word itself has the idea of dividing and that it could have been that these are folks that cast lots in order to determine. Remember, now you you could cast lots, and there were several different ways of casting lots in the Old Testament. To, to oversimplify it, it would be casting of lots might be sort of like the magic eight ball of our day, if you will. Of course, I know that's kind of even out of date, but they would say maybe throw dice or the equivalent of what was dice or rocks a lot of times and they would cast them and depending upon how the how these things fell th that would be their answer you know sort of like say you know uh, you ask the magic eight ball you know is the sky blue and you shake it and it might say well maybe <laughs> well that was sort of the idea of casting of lots it could have been that that's what these people did. We really don't know because this is this um, instance and the Ezekiel instance is really the only two in the Bible. 
Philistine diviners. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But 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 in that vein, and, and that's right, in that vein, think about the fact that they, uh, as one individual said that I was reading, he talked about how that it seemed, at least to him, that these folks were trying to get rid of the ark without giving it back to Israel. In other words, what can we do? This was this man's thought. What can we do with this ark and still have control over it but give it back to Israel? I guess the only thing you could do in those circumstances is, do you want to rent it to them? But uh, I don't know if that author was correct. But, yeah, they just, anybody, give us give us a thought. They wanted to return it. In verse 3, so they said, if you send away the ark of, of God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Put something in it. That was their answer. In other words, return it with a prize. Return it with a present. <laughs> a, a trespass offering, a sin offering, a sacrifice, really, in many ways. That's what a, a trespass offering is. And so they're basically saying, let's put something in it. And then notice the conclusion that they had. They said, okay, we're going to send it back. We're going to put something in it. And then they said, then you will be healed. Now, remember, that was also part of the problem. The, the, the bubonic plague was, was part of the problem. That uh, Remember, folks were dying, and we'll see this again here in just a few minutes. But it's believed that, uh, that the bubonic plague, because it talks about, uh, as we'll see in verse 4, the making of an idol with rats. And rats were, they're not necessarily, well, they're not the carrier of the bubonic plague. The fleas on the rats are the carriers of the bubonic plague. And, uh, of course, history fascinates Steve. Steve's out of town tonight. But history fascinates Steve. And, and so he and I were talking about it last Wednesday night out in the parking lot. Our, both of our wives were out of town. And so we got to doing a little research uh, the bubonic plague hit the United States in the early 1900s, and there was a rat infestation at that time. And so uh, this is believed to have been happening here in 1 Samuel 6, and they want to get rid of it. But notice it says, and if you know when you put this, give this ark back with the present inside it, and you're healed, that it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. In other words, this is your sign. And so then they said, what's the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered five golden tumors, and we talked about those last week, and five golden rats according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For the same plague was on all of you and on your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods, and from your land. And so the guilt offering was thought among those folks that were advising the Philistines. The guilt offering will appease God. Now you got to remember the Philistines' concept of God versus the true concept of God was different. Philistines were polytheistic. They, they had many gods. Dagon was, number one, chief god, if you will, but they had many gods. And so being polytheistic, being folks that had many gods, their concept of God, appeasing the wrath of God. Remember, uh, we still think of, of folks that are... Uh, Oh, how do you say this? They're not worshiping God. They're, they're third world countries that are out and have many gods that there's usually when something bad happens, whether it's bad in the universe or bad with the weather or bad to the individual, that you or and or your group have made their gods mad. Well, the Philistines had that concept 
really that concept goes even farther back than the Philistines. But the Philistines had that idea. And notice what it says. It says you carry it back, you, you make this these idols, you make these images of your tumors and, and the rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Glory to the God of Israel. Confess your sins. Is almost, and perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your God, and from your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? Notice that even in history, history still knew what history was. They understood. What about Pharaoh? See, they understood. But it's interesting, you might say, well, they understood. These are Philistines. The Philistines understood the history of the Israelites. Why are you going to be like the Egyptians and Pharaoh when their hearts were hardened? Why, when he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? Now, therefore, make a new cart, make, or take, excuse me, two milk cows, which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Then, t- okay, I want to discuss all this, but let's read it. Then t- the ark of the Lord set it on the cart, put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering and a chest by its side, then send it away and let it go. And watch, if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. And so, verse 6, they, these folks that are advising the Philistines, they said, look, didn't you learn anything? Don't you remember about God and about the Egyptians and about how the, the, the Egyptians eventually let the children of Israel go? And so there's a, a quick reminder. Now, could they have said more? Yes. Did they? Probably yes among the people. But this is how we have it recorded for us. And, and notice what they say. <clears throat> what they say, excuse me. When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? Now, therefore, take a new cart. Let me ask you a question. How was the Ark of the Covenant supposed to be carried? Poles, priests, what else? On your shoulder, yeah. Right, only priest, by hand, only on foot, not in carts, not on carts. It's thought that the Philistines may have, we don't know, but may have transported the ark from the battlefield back in the third chapter and fourth chapter to their land this very way on a cart. And the reason that is supposed is because the way according to what we have been able to figure out through history and through reading and archaeology and different things that this is the way the philistines transported their gods was by cart and so while we might say well this is not the way you carry the ark that's right but it was the way the philistines carried their gods and so probably did carry if you will the ark of the covenant this way but as we said, it was, remember, it was supposed to be poles were supposed to be be carried through because there was a ring on each corner. The poles carried, were, were put through the, 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 the rings, and then it was carried on shoulders, it was carried on priest shoulders, and it was to be walled. So, yes, there, there we have the answer. But they were going to put it on a new cart, take two milk cows, which has never been yoked, hitch the cows to the cart, take their calves home away from them. Well, isn't that just a wonderful thought? But take them away from them. Then take the ark to the Lord and set it on the cart. Or excuse me, the ark of the Lord. And set it on the cart and put the articles of gold, the the images that we have made, the images that are man-made, which, notice it says, which you are returning to him as a trespass offering. In other words, this is our sin offering. I think this is interesting. I think that that it's interesting that the Philistines believe that this is a sin offering and that they need to give a sin offering to God and it will appease God. Now, it's not the right kind of offering. It's golden images. But at the same point in time, too, 
they have a concept of Israel's religion, Israel's faith. And so they're they're meeting it, but if you will, they're meeting it halfway. They're carrying the ark the wrong way. They're offering a trespass offering, which is not from the standpoint of did God take trespass offerings? Yes, go back to the book of Leviticus, but not this count. And so it, it reminds us of folks today that try to do what God says halfway, half of the time, halfway. They know enough to be dangerous. I don't know. I, I may have used this story before. I don't know if um, if the name John Gibson, as far as preachers goes, if it would be familiar here. John was a preacher in Memphis, Tennessee, for many years, many, many years. John appeared on a, a local TV um, show. There was a show that came on every Sunday morning at 7 o'clock out of Memphis. I think it was on WHBQ or I think, but it might have been on uh, another channel. But anyway, it was a, it was a, a TV show that preachers sat at a desk, and there was a, a Catholic, a Roman Catholic. There was a Greek Orthodox. There was an American Baptist, which is a, a black uh, belief, if you will, Southern Baptist preacher, and John Gibson, uh, who, like I say, Church of Christ preacher, if you let me kind of use that phraseology, and uh, and a moderator. And questions were submitted. Now, not I I don't know this fact, but I really do believe that they then in turn sent it to those guys, and so they kind of knew the questions as they were coming. But anyway, uh, it was interesting because especially when I first got out of Fried Hardeman and I started watching the show on Sunday mornings, getting ready for church, that John, of course, represented the, the word of God eloquently. And it was quite interesting that time, from time to time, uh, these guys, a question would be asked and they would just say, John, what's the answer? Or John, what do you say? Before any of them would give an answer. And then their answer would play off of John's and not answer the question. But John, John, John knew uh, a little Greek, and the Greek Orthodox. Now you got to understand Greek Orthodox. They, of course, that's their worship, their faith. Everything's based in Greek text. And John, every once in a while, he would say, you know, something about the Greek says. And finally, one day, they asked the Greek Orthodox, and he says, "Well, John knows a little Greek. In other words, enough to be dangerous." He said, "Well." That's kind of the way the Philistines were. They knew enough to be dangerous, but they weren't doing the complete truth. And obedience is all about the complete obedience, not partial. That's not obedience. That's really doing what you want to do. These folks were kind of doing what they wanted to do, but they thought, if we do all this, notice what it says, then send this this cart with these two calves that are leaving their, their calves, if you will, at home, Send it away and watch as it goes and see which way it goes. If it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, and Beth Shemesh was in, um, well, it was in Benjamin. If you if you know, if you go back and look in the back of your book in, in uh, on a map where the tribe of Benjamin, that land was settled, that's where Beth Shemesh is, not far from the Philistines. Then he has done us this great evil. So their thought was, okay, you watch that cart, you watch those you watch those those cows and, and the taking of that cart, and if it goes up to Beth Shemesh, then we know what? That God, our God, Yahweh, Jehovah God, our God, of course not their God, but from the standpoint of the Philistines, but our God as we know it, has done this evil to us. But if not, then we'll know that it wasn't his hand, but it was simply done by chance. Now we believe God's in control, and we believe that God, excuse me, is sovereign, and so therefore God runs and rules the universe. Uh, there's always that discussion that that follows then, as far as as. Uh, where does free will come in, and does God allow us? Or does God really allow us to do and to pick and choose as we want to, or does God cause us and 
the Bible really is very plain, I think, that God does not cause us to do things. God allows us to pick and choose and make decisions. And in that, God then, through his hand and through being in charge, works things out. And so it's a, it's a picture that we understand from the standpoint of looking at it in a term that's not found in the Bible, but found in theological circles, and that's the word providence. Therein lies the providence of God. But they're, they're saying it's cha- it could be a, a chance. In other words, it just, it just happened that way. The, anything anybody want to say before we move on? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they acknowledge that it's the Lord. Anything else? Very good. It would be, yes, for them. Yeah, the Philistines did. Yeah, yeah. This is the this was this is our best, if you will. Anything else? All good. Then the men did so. They took to so in other words, here was the advice that was given. And so the men did so. They took the two milk cows, hitched them to the cart, shut up their calves at home, and they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went. Of course, they'd be lowing. First of all, they'd never been yoked. Second of all, not only they'd never been yoked, but now they're separated from their their old cows, their old calves, rather. Suzanne showed me a a video yesterday of a mama bear. I don't know if this was in in the um, no Smoke Mountain or where it was, but it was a video, and it's a mama bear, and you see her walking on a a tree that has fallen across a creek in water. And then in, as you watch the video, the mama bear turns around and comes back. And then all of a sudden you don't see her, but you see three little bitty bears running across. And then the, the video widened out just a little bit. And then the mama bear is walking beside them on another tree. And so they all get in a line then, and they're almost to the other side. And the first of the three little cubs makes a little misstep and just about falls off of the, the tree that he's walking on. And so the little cub, that mother turns around immediately. She's going to see what's going on with her mama or her baby. Well, that's a mother's love for her baby. Well, you can imagine these two milk cows separated from their young, the, the lowing that they must have had. And so it says that they did not turn aside to the right hand or the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. They never wanted, the children of Israel never wanted it to, to leave. Now, remember one of the problems was is that um, back earlier on in in First Samuel, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, and where did we say it was? Shiloh, right? Shiloh, and it's it's believed that if you go back to to the third chapter and the the Battle of of Aphek that we talked about when the Ark was taken away, that it's believed that Shiloh was destroyed then or very soon after it, and so it's believed at this point in time that Shiloh was basically in ruins. And that's one of the reasons that the Ark of the Covenant does not go back to Shiloh, that it does go to Beth Shemesh. Well, the children of Israel are delighted. They're reaping wheat, but all of a sudden they see the Ark coming. They rejoice. The Ark came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. Now, now here's something to point out. If we go back to Joshua 21, when we studied the book of Joshua, we find out that Beth Shemesh was a priestly city. 
So while Shiloh wasn't necessarily the home, you know, or wasn't in existence, and it was considered the home, uh, this was a, a, a priestly city that it went to. And it gets there, and notice that there's a large stone that was there. So that they split the wood of the cart, offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Now, I want you to keep this in mind, because in about two more verses, or one or two more verses, this is going to be important. Not that you don't know it, but just remember it. There's a difference between a sacrifice and a burnt offering. And notice that it says burnt offering here. Uh, when you find the words burnt offering in the Bible, it usually pertains to a destruction or a, a, kill, a, a burning, if you will, of the whole animal. A thoroughly charred animal. And sacrifice would be where you would take maybe some of the meat and you would eat some of the meat and you would only offer a part of the animal truly as a sacrifice to God. But you would eat another part. And so there was a difference there. But notice they took these two cows. They offered them as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it in which were the articles of gold and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings, made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. So you have, once again, you have burnt offerings and sacrifices. They did both. It's, it's probably a, a sign of commitment. That's usually what burnt offerings are, signs of commitment. But it's also, if you will, sacrifice, giving praise, glory, and thanksgiving. To God for what has taken place, for the fact that, that that which was gone, that that Ark of the Covenant was not with them for a while, is now home. And so they're, they're giving praise and thanksgiving to God for the fact that it is now home. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. Okay, they, they've gotten the five lords we talked about. We, we don't really know what that is. We talked about the, the lords in uh, the Philistine lords last chapter. It might be city leaders, and that's what that's where a lot of folks lean is that it, the five major cities, some have said that it was the religious leaders of the Philistines. That's where some folks lean. We're not really sure. I think we can take we can take a step back and say these are folks that, had some importance to the Philistines and they have a report and they are going back telling the Philistines what the children of Israel did with regards to the, the cart and the animals and the Ark of the Covenant. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Geza, one for Eskelon, one for Gath, one for Ekron, and the golden rats according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the large stone of Abel, on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stones remain to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. So here, notice what it says. They take these things, and notice that it talks about how that these this golden rat, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines and belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities, even as far as the large stone of Abel of which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua Beth Shemesh. This is not, I don't think, and in my research, this is the conclusion that I've come to. This is not the same stone that we're going to talk about in the next chapter where the Ebenezer that is raised. It is a stone that just simply was a land marking. And so it was a place where they could understand what had happened and remember what had happened. Old Testament folks, to their credit, I'm not saying this to, to, the, to bemoan them or belittle them, but I would say to their credit, were big on memorials big on, on 
having things, putting things places. You know, we have road signs and markers and and, and all kinds of different uh, plaques and signs and so forth to remind us of history and events and things of that nature. They often put, say, a stone. Well, what does this stone mean? We studied that here a few weeks ago on Sunday morning out of the book of Exodus. This is a reminder. And history was often then told and repeated to the children as they came upon these things, which, which the United States would do well to learn from. And I say that because if you go to Deuteronomy 6, when Moses reveals there really the formula for a nation's greatness, part of it is learning where you came from and about your history and about your past. Anyway, get off that soapbox before I get in trouble. <laughs> but verse 19, then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,000 and men of the people and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. All right, here we got a problem. Does anybody's Bible not say 50,000 and 70 men? Yeah, what did I say? 70, 70, yeah. This is a, a difficulty with regards to translation. Uh, Josephus has 70 men. And we don't know where the 50,000 came from. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm not saying that it's not true. But a good many of the the what would be considered good, reliable versions, the RSV and, and the ESV, um, and and others, the NIV, I know, has it, like say Josephus in his translation has it as 70 men. What's the right answer? I'll let you decide. I have my own opinion. I don't think personally to get involved in the, the textual criticism that we would have to get involved with with regards to the verse that it's that important. But I would say what's important is, is that God struck them. God struck certain ones that looked. The people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with great slaughter. Now, one of the things we know is that who could look inside the ark? Turn with me to Numbers chapter 4. Let's look at, at beginning in verse 17 of Numbers chapter 4. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not cut off the tribe of the families of the Kohathites from among the Levites, but do this in regard to them, that they may live and not die when they approach the most holy thing. And his son shall go in and appoint each of them to his service and his task, but they shall not go in to watch while the holy things are being covered lest they die priesthood it's all good and so what we have here is folks that violated the will of god by looking inside the ark and they weren't supposed to and god struck them and we look at that and we think my how terrible god is how vengeful god is how harsh god is well, we have to admit, God has a severe side. The Bible says he does. God has a just side. God has a fair side. Justice really, if you break it down and oversimplify it, and I know I'm oversimplifying it, but justice really is fair. Fairness, that's really what it is. That's what it's about. Fairness, being fair. God has to be fair to everybody. And so he has to be equal. And sometimes that means that there's some hardness that comes about. And there's some things that we look at and we say, man, that, that's difficult to swallow. Well, you know, when, when us transported the ark, that, that created a problem, right? 
This is another time. The ark created a problem, and the problem was not with God, was it? The problem was with men and how they were reacting to what God had told them. That's where the problem really laid. Stretch out his hand. Uh, that's a little discussion in there. That's a good point, yeah. And, uh, and so anything else? I, I do want to finish the chapter. Anything else? And the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before the Holy Lord God? This is a an interesting question that is asked. And to whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kerjath Jerem, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. They get rid of the ark. They felt like God was, was dangerous. They wanted to get rid of the ark. And in many ways, Philistines, they wanted to get rid of God. As we read this chapter, we have to find something that, or an application that means something to us out of this chapter. And here's the question. How do we appease God? How do we make God happy? How do we appease him? How do, knowing that, as Paul said in the book of Romans, behold the goodness and the severity of God. And there have been books written on, uh, chapters written on, uh, Packer, J.I. Packer had one on God Speaks, uh, a chapter on, on the goodness and severity of God. And there's been a bunch of other books. That's one of the classics. Though. And for a lot of folks, it's hard to reconcile. But it still gets down to the question, how do we appease God? How do we make him happy? By doing what he's told us to do in the way he's told us to do it, when he's told us to do it. That's how we make God happy. And unfortunately, these Philistines didn't for whatever reason. Any questions, comments, thoughts? Suggestions. Absolutely. Anything else? All right, well, we're going to start the seventh chapter. And the seventh chapter is is really more, uh, it's a short chapter. It's really more of a summary of what we've just studied. And then when we get into the eighth chapter, we all of a sudden, we find uh, two individuals that will be very important through about the 15th chapter as we'll look at, at uh, beginning at the 8th chapter, and we'll see Samuel, and we'll see Saul. Saul will come upon the scene. Uh, the children of Israel, of course, will, will eventually make him king in chapters 8 through 15, and so that kind of tells you where we're headed. And so... What I'm basically, I guess, trying to say is we may not take all of our time next week on the seventh chapter. We'll maybe try to ease on into the eighth chapter. So if you're reading ahead, that might help you. Anything else? Do you remember Vicki and her family? Uh, tough time. Tough time when you lose your mother. And uh, we do pray for them and for Doreen and her family, or for Doreen's family, I guess we should say. Um, I talked to one of her sons, not the one that has come to church two or three times with her, but a different one today. He's the one that called me and gave me the information, and he was really uh, shook up, And as, he, as it's understandable. But we want to remember them, even though there will not be a service here, remember them in our, in our prayer, especially for these two, two boys to, to go and have a safe trip because they're going to be going uh, to Pennsylvania uh, to right outside of Philadelphia and uh, taking her remains there when that they're able to get them released. And so remember these folks. Remember them in your prayers. Also, I was told a while ago, uh, Charles and Nancy Drake's anniversary is coming up. And so they're not able to come anymore. You want to send them a card? They're probably listening. Sorry, but we're going to send you a card. <laughs> but uh, um, anything else? And I failed. I'm glad I was told different. Hope Lodge, see, see Pat. But it's on Tuesday night. I had it on my calendar wrong. 
and uh, I'm glad I was corrected because I'd probably had to go two nights in a row. <laughs> but uh, if you can go, that's a great thing. Anything else? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, for the many blessings of it. Thankful for the opportunity that we've had to study your word. And we always want to put our best foot forward. And we know sometimes, Lord, we fail. We fail you. We don't do what we are supposed to do and what you want us to do. By all means, help us to, to live a life that is for and with you. Give us the strength that we need, the courage that we need, the boldness that we need to live with you and for you. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us and keep us. Be with those that we just mentioned and that Jay mentioned in the announcements. Uh, Bless these folks and keep them and watch over them and hold them. Watch over all of us and bless us and keep us. Forgive us of our sins, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all have a great evening.